So good evening, everybody, and welcome to this snowy TWED. So we're virtual today, uh, missing out on the wonderful pies and pizza pies, but we'll make up for that in the, in the near future. Um, uh, we're, today, we're very happy to have Brenda Thompson, the uh, Ted Lewis World uh, PhD candidate, um, talking about bibliometrics. Um, we're all looking forward to that. Uh, just a couple logistical reminders. We're recording this uh, tonight. Uh, Brenda, I, I think you're welcoming of questions. Is that right? Yes, absolutely. Uh, like to we, be a discussion. Okay, so it's a discussion throughout. Um, and just keep in mind, everybody, that you are being recorded. And with that, I'm going to kill my share. Okay. And Brenda, you can start sharing and take it away. Let's see if this actually works. It does. Okay. Are we? Looks great. Hit it. I like this Good. one much better. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, thank you everybody for being here, first of all. Um, thank you for the nice introduction, John, of course. And um, so basically, yeah, bibliometrics. Um, here to kind of talk about the limitations and the possibilities. And um, so without further ado, let's kind of, let's start by, um, okay, and my keyboard just died. Can, maybe I can't. Let me see. Okay, there we go. <laughs> so, um, start with a quick definition, right? So, what is bibliometrics? I want to make sure we can kind of get all get off to the same start here. And so, um, it it really is just when you go to a library, right? It's it's essentially com it's the statistics that they use on essentially a paper compared to a paper. Um, so, with that, you know. So what does it all really actually mean to us as scientists or as researchers is that for funding reasons, for our own work, for to advance our own research, right? We all kind of get locked into having to do a literature review. And so with that, right, you always kind of start with a, uh, with going to, you know, Web of Science or Scopus or um, Google, Google Scholar, right? This is kind of, and these are actual bibliometric searches. So, um, and so what we do with those uh, when we're looking at a literature review is, you know, we get our search results and then we kind of evaluate and what bibliometrics can provide is an evaluation of those sources, right? So that are actually from the results that are returned from our bibliometric search. And then with that, we move on to trying to identify themes and looking at debates and gaps in the literature so that we can actually then, of course, um, provide our outline and, and then ultimately write our literature review. Um, the, so bibliometrics is very strong in the first two. And then by the time we get to identifying themes, debates and gaps is where, though bibliometrics is there and available, um, some of it actually, this is where it starts to falter. We don't really have those aspects involved. So what does that actually look like, right? So what is happening with bibliometric search, right? We start with doing the actual search and what we get back is the literature. And then that literature that we do have should be, you know, essentially our uh, relevant to what we are focused on learning or trying, you know, trying to get, get at, at, at the base level. And so what we get from bibliometrics is exactly this. We get the sources, the authors, and the documents. And what's really kind of easy to get out of that is, of course, you know, we can find what's the most relevant, who's the most cited, um, and, you know, what, what is happening within those papers, actually, right? So how many papers are being published per year? And we have um, Bradford's Law here in the sources, which is kind of an interesting uh, limitation that is, that, that exists. And basically what Bradford's law says is that um, it essentially estimates ex estimates the exponentially diminishing returns of searching for references in science journals. So basically, if a researcher has like five core journals um, that they're um, interested in, right, five core journals for their specific science domain, 
um, and say that in one month there are like 12 available uh, articles of interest. In order to find another 12 articles of interest, they're going to have to go search in 10 journals, 10 more journals. So basically, so it, what happens is that after you, you know, after an author or after a researcher has gone and looked in 5, 10, 20, 40 journals, then there's, you realize there's no point. And so what happens is that the library has decided, you know, the Bradford's Laws explains that libraries, uh, for libraries, it's, it's sufficient to have just those five core journals. So we're, that's a big limitation. And then if you'll notice with authors, we have Lotka's Law. And what, what's happening there is this is a, a law that describes the frequency of publications by authors in a given field. And so basically, so for the number of authors that are publishing a certain number of articles, um, this is a fixed ratio uh, to uh, the total number of authors publishing a single article. So basically, as the number of articles published, you know, goes, uh, increases, what happens is that authors producing publications becomes less frequent. So again, limiting factors that happen as a result of, uh, you know, bibliometrics, it, just the nature of people, if you will. So, and so now, so just so that we're all clear on where we're starting from, I'm kind of going to get touch on some real super basics here. And um, that's it. So this is uh, Scopus, which we have access to via either API or just because for, you know, RPI staff and students. And um, so this is scopus.org. And what we have here, right, is you'll notice um, when you go to this to start your search, you have doc, you can search by documents, authors, you know, you can search the researchers and uh, any, you can also search by affiliation. And with that, then you can also do this add, add addition of search fields, which is the large list on the left. Um, so you can really kind of narrow down your search when you first start. We're probably all very familiar with this, I assume. Um, but, and so what I did was a, a search on the origins of life and, you know, with, with no constraints, just for this example. And so for this, um, I've got 6,500 results. And if we're researchers doing, a literature review, nobody's reading 6,500 <laughs> documents. Um, so to get at that further, what we have here then in, on the left-hand side is the, the facets of the search, right? And these are kind of determined by the metadata that's available uh, within, you know, whichever service, and in this case, Scopus, that you're uh, subscribed to here. And so we can then, of course, narrow the search down greatly as we move through and refine those facets. So um, just for argument's sake here, I, oh, let's assume, right, that um, I've managed to use the facets to whittle this down to like 300 or so. So re something reasonable for a literature review. Um, <clears throat> but what we realized is over here, what I've highlighted is uh, we have some documents as well as uh, the secondary documents will actually be those documents that are directly cited in the original list of documents. Um, you can also wind up looking to see if there are any patents on any of the uh, works that, that are presented in your final results. And what happened? Um, yeah, okay. And then I wanna point out specifically, there's this option here to analyze search results. And so this gives us bibliometric search. And what that kind of looks like basically is something this simple, right? So this is what you're looking at as documents year, per year by source, source being which particular journals, which I've got highlighted at the bottom in the red bracket here. And so what you'll see, right, the source here is journals. So, you know, what's, who's publishing on, uh, what's the number of documents by journal uh, for origins of life over time? So that's basically what we're looking at. What I want to point out here is if you'll notice, we have the blue line up here and as well as the red. And um, so even though, you know, uh, metadata can give us problems in, in, in this way, what I know what's happened here was that uh, if we look down at the names of the, the journals in particular, one is ends in the biosphere and the other one ends in biospheres. But around 2007, we decided there were more biospheres to explore. So 
the journal just you know slightly changed its name, but this kind of error could be easy to miss. So something to think about. So further on the you know analysis of search results, it's going to give us, like I said earlier, right number of documents by author, documents by affiliations, and these affiliations, just word to the wise, you know, if you are doing specific research, this could also be a great way to look for um, people that might, or in, industries or uh, employers, potential employers, that's what I'm trying to say. And finally, you know, they give you the, the ultimate pie chart. And uh, again, this is just subject areas and it's gonna be based on journals again, as to what is, uh, you know, based on how that particular journal is already classified. Again, this is all locked into the metadata. So with that, um, still a peek at, oh, yes, one big thing. This is still a paper to paper analysis. We haven't even gotten into the context at all. And so just to give us another quick background, I'm gonna pick on Professor Schaller. Um, and so, you know, when you go to Google Scholar, you can, pick this up, you can sort by title, you know, you can sort by how many times this was cited. Um, you can look at the year, but ultimately their bibliometric tools are just this, right? So again, citations, how many citations do you have? Um, we have the H index making an appearance. And, uh, and then, you know, ultimately how many papers and when they're cited across the years. So still no context. So, Ultimately, let's take a peek at what other bibliometric tools are available. And for that, we have an external program known as Voss Viewer, which I'm gonna, you know, this Voss Viewer requires a Java runtime environment. Um, it is a free service and does provide a lot of network analysis. Again, um, this will kind of let you dig into some of the context, but I can't run it on mine with that because of Java issues. So. I haven't dealt too, too much with that. Next is SiteSpace. Now this is one that came out in 2016. It's uh, external, but it is a paid for if you wanna do more than 50 articles at a time. So it's it's out there, it's available to, to do some analysis with, where it'll actually let you get into the context of the papers a bit, but not, not great. And finally, there's, um, excuse me, Python has a package and R has a package as well. So give you an idea of what that looks like. Again, the, another bibliometric tool, this is R's bibliometrics program or package, <clears throat> excuse me. And the um, what we have happening here is in off to each corner, right? Describes the quadrant. And again, you know, origins of life in my particular case, I am very interested in only the only origins of life on Earth. So as you can see, the bibliometric search that I did actually returned very little. You know, Earth is there, but most of it has everything to do with astrobiology and space, et cetera. I'm particularly interested in drilling down to prebiotic chemistry. And that's almost, you know, that's weakly developed and marginal uh, in that lower left corner. So I would need to certainly refine my search to get at what I need. And again, this still, if you look at it in the upper right corner, you'll see that one of them is article, right? So again, we're still looking at a paper to paper analysis. So I explained this, this earlier. So what I'm suggesting is that we get to play some metadata games and with a few other um, options we could, do this, we could actually add on the mapping of the science, which is what I think when we do literature reviews is probably what we're actually looking to do. Um, we need to get at the concepts in the literature, the knowledge in the literature, and kind of knowing what's happening socially will absolutely help us understand uh, and give us more of what we need for um, getting at our grant funding or things of this nature. So let's kind of talk about the workflow on this. Um, so <clears throat> the data acquisition starts with the bibliometric analysis, right? This is that. And then what bibliometrics is really providing at this point is these citation networks, right? And um, the site, you know, we establish these, right? Citation relationships and it, 
goes on to essentially build a, a, a something that we can look at as the knowledge landscape, if you will, of of the topics uh, in the academic articles. And what I'm suggesting is we move to you know incorporating semant more semantic analysis. And to do that, we would have to start with once we've got the the data, then we're going to have to first of all initially clean it, and then uh, and then we can move to doing some network science um, to work out basically a hierarchical step of how the science has progressed, and that'll be a combination of network uh, of network science as well as uh, some processing in with natural language processing. Sorry. And then finally, um, to get at the evolution of a particular topic, and so we can look at emerging uh, research and things of that sort, we could lay it out and do some evolutionary pathways. So <clears throat> just to give you an idea, so again, here's the bibliometric results. We're gonna have to initially clean all of this data. And to do that, of course, I'm not sure who knows, what the processes are, but we can, you know, essentially clean up all of this data, make the words, uh, tokenize the literature itself into actual words or paragraphs, depending on how we want to analyze. And then, you know, come up with some su summary statistics before we move on to doing further analysis. And at this point is also when we can really start asking some questions of the data and determining what needs to be, what we could actually get out of this. And so with part of this, um, we need to do some feature engineering, right? So if we are able to tag, these are common NLP methods, right? So if we can actually um, do the parts of speech tagging, tag a noun as a noun, um, then we can actually, and get rid of all of those other the uh, is a, um, then we can get at what is actually happening in the paper. Um, Additionally, we could move on to named entity recognition, identifying, you know, those from the metadata fields themselves, pulling out that information that's also in the paper. Um, and finally, we have to get around to something like a word sense disambiguation, right? So am I talking about, um, am I talking about when I say bass or bass, right? Spelled the same way, B-A-S-S. -S. Am I talking about a fish or am I talking about a guitar? <laughs> so we have to be able to pull that from the context as well. Um, next up, we would do some topic extraction and modeling. Um, and again, we're going to look for identifying those main topics. Um, and to do that, we'll have to use some algorithms before we get around to doing the actual modeling. Um, and we have to construct a corpus and things of this sort to get through the natural language processing part of this. Um, next up would be then well, after we've got you know our topics clearly extracted and we have an idea of what's going on, then we can rearrange the data again to um, uh, to do some more network science on that. And um, I'm gonna start with, again, some sticking with some real basics so we're all on the same page. So um, the blue dots here um, are essentially components in the network. So let's assume that each one of those round blue circles is a, uh, is actually a paper, I'll go with paper. Um, and so these papers, right, uh, these components are all part of one network. And so as you can see, so what connects the papers would be citations. So one paper citing another paper. Um, and so these components, though part of the same network, aren't connected. And this might be because you have different topics going on or could be a litany of, of other issues. Um, but ultimately, what we then would move to is kind of pulling out those communities that exist. And, and in this case, maybe what I've circled here, this could be papers that are all on the same topic um, or have the same author or depending on which metadata field you're, you're exploring. And so um, these components, uh, lead to the communities. But what we also need to think about too is the centrality with things like this particular um, node would actually be, a, a would have a high centrality because it's connecting this 
other paper that would otherwise not be part of this component or this community um, without, you know, without this particular, without that particular node. So, um, so again, so if you are looking at, you could be looking at this from the perspective of a paper or the perspective of an author or um, any of the actual metadata fields that are available. So there's a, a the ability to drill down to a singular paper or a singular community, but there's a lot more information here. So let's kind of take a look at what the centrality would mean if we can actually, you know, when we actually get these papers uh, into this network structures. And so here um, we have this, we have degree centrality, which we can see at the, the gray node in the center, right? If, if that particular paper wasn't there, then, then none of these uh, other papers are connected. Uh, and so and then we have a between this centrality that we can check where we can see that there might be two communities or two topics that uh, are connected by this one particular author or this one particular paper, meaning that um, without that particular contribution, um, you know, they would be two entirely different things. So as someone doing a literature review, you know, you might want to just go pick that particular thing to explore. And again, we, then we have closeness centrality, which in this case, the lower, um, the lower one here would um, not even be connected. And this could be a very a highly influential paper um, that without the gray central one wouldn't be connected again to the rest of the network. Finally, there's eigenvector centrality, which this gray node in this case, in an eigenvector situation, when you pull that particular centrality out of it, um, what it's measuring is it's it's an important paper that is connected to other highly ranked nodes. So other highly ranked papers or other highly ranked authors. So this, again, this is something you, someone or something you might want to take a peek at in order to get further into your own literature review. So with that, you know, let's talk about, you know, if we look at the, all of the, if all of these, uh, the circles are actual nodes, right, are papers in the network, um, and we're doing a literature review, um, if we look at how this is structured, what we'll see, what we notice here is that we may be able to get away with just reading these two papers to determine whether or not um, we need to, to further trace out this, this network of papers. And additionally, I mean, at worst case scenario, we could read all four of these and decide whether or not we need to delve further into these other cited papers. And so that's basically what I wanted to present on. I wanted to talk some more about, um, you know, metadata fields here. Um, one of the ways, you know, how are we accounting for in bibliometrics? How are we accounting for things like semantic shifts? Um, and for example, um, I'm a dog lover, so I'll go with, you know, it used to be way back when we all dogs were referred to as hounds, right? When you said hounds, it, it meant you could refer to any dog. And then that has over time shifted to hounds being a specific set of dogs, namely hunting dogs. Um, and uh, yeah, so what, I'm very curious to hear what people are thinking about uh, what metadata might go into bibliometrics to make it more accessible, um, a better way for us as researchers to get at grants and funding and uh, not have to be so laborious with our uh, literature reviews. So with that, so throw open the door to the discussion. A, a bunch of questions. So Brenda, this is pretty amazing. This is really um, in very short time, not not even half an hour. You've you've really uh, just totally highlighted this field. Um, I had a, a couple questions. One that came to mind. Um, you know, when you're talking about named entity uh, recognition and and tagging, um, are there curated lists, curated author lists, either provided by uh, the indexing services or people 
um, you named a couple of the platforms, one bibliometrics, which is, it's actually researcher based. Um, and I believe is open source. I know it is an R, it is an R package um, and a pretty big platform. Are there these curated authors lists that could be relied upon? Because that's a huge, <laughs> a, a huge gotcha right there. Yeah, I was going to say so. And that's the thing that, you know, my research has always been so broad that, um, you know, when you're interdisciplinary, it can be really hard to, I mean, there's, it depends where you're interdisciplinary, right? <laughs> what your other domains are. And so, yeah, I'm not really sure. I haven't run across curated lists of authors, but I'm imagining, right, that with, um, that it should be easy enough that top, you know, main journals would have those lists available fairly readily. But I'm but not it would, really sure. It would, well, it would also be intellectual property, though, right? <laughs> right. Yeah. See? Yeah. Six <laughs> one, yeah. half dozen the other. Um, uh, the the other question was actually that I had off the top of my head was related to bibliometrics. Have you ex so what you're talking about is a lot of tools, a lot of toolage to to yeah. to to um, to build this out for a in a, an emerging field, say, or a, a field that hasn't had bibliometrics robustly applied to it, like some others right. might have. Um, so there's you've there's many, many different moving parts in terms of toolage. Have you explored uh, available, uh, what platforms, what tools e exist that you could leverage? Like just to shine a light on bibliometrics, is it something that, I know that it's used by people who are doing this to kind of explore and, and explore their particular fields it's it's kind of cool that way, but um, is it does it have toolage that you could use uh, for your to to capture the and 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 build up a, a knowledge base yourself? If you know what I'm asking. Yeah. I, so just to clarify, right? Um, so like um, so in terms of. Uh, like Google Scholar, let me go back to the, but no, not Google Scholar, but uh, Scopus, right? So one of the things on Scopus's site, right, um, was, let's see, let me go back. To, so the secondary documents, no, this part where you are at the researcher discovery. Um, that That's a kind of a different tool in that it does allow you to look directly at collaborations um gives you but again it's statistics on you know who's it's going to give you something very similar to this type of list uh -huh. um right and so yeah so do, are we building something you know some of the tools that i've found to be useful still relates to um getting something into a network structure uh so in you know if if it if it's not supplied directly from your bibliometric results getting it in is getting into a network structure is its own set of right you've got to get it to that space but once you're there there's tools like graphia is one of the uh free programs that's available to kind of explore it from a from a um network perspective but as far as one there's not yet a tool that lets you run through the whole process. Nothing I've found. I would be curious if anybody else has some stuff that they've found. I'm, I'm curious about other people's questions. I have a question for you, Brenda. Okay. Good talk. This is like part of a whole part of chapter two. <laughs> yes. Um, so, when you're trying to do a literature review, 
What do you see as the benefit of bibliometric tools as opposed to just a plain old keyword search in Google Scholar or on a library website? I mean, why go into the statistical relationships of papers and authors if all you want is a list of things to read? Well, um, so great question. Thank you. But so let me, I'll respond with this one, right? In that, so yes, you could scope it down, but you're still going to get so getting it down to a manageable level or focused enough um, is part of the bibliometric process. Um, and the benefit of having something, doing something more with it with the bibliometric results, right? It, the results help you narrow down what you might want to read. The network analysis and the NLP would say, if, if you're, you know, if you have 300 papers, you might want to start with just reading these three really important ones and decide what that, you know, as an expert, what does that give you to consider? Well, then that begs the question of how do you label what is important? Because really with bibliometrics, you're looking at impact of the paper. If you right. just want to know what's out there, a simple keyword search will get you that information. And right. in terms of what you think you should read, if it's if you're looking for an overview, you don't need a bibliometric result to give you an overview paper or a survey paper. You do need a bibliometric result to measure the impact of that paper on the science. And then how do you factor in the, the temporal thing? If, if we were studying, if we were studying uh, generative neural networks and, and uh, deep learning, that sort of thing, and we, and we started our reading prior to 2017, we were gonna get one kind of view of the world. And then a, a couple of <laughs> papers started happening in 2017 that just changed everything. And we saw just a new propagation of that. So I'm wondering to what extent is, is that, how is those sort of, how do these existing tools kind of show those temporal shifts? Uh, that's actually her thesis. So don't make her give you the answer ahead of time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, to be honest, yeah. I mean, so. Um, you know, publication dates um, are absolutely part of, you know, the bibliometric results, right? The, the metadata is there on when this paper was published. Um, and, you know, the idea, of course, you know, is here in the, the essentially what I have is the, um, this last column to the right, right? Where you have, you have to identify relationships. Um, you've got to get the topics. And then you've got to give weight to those topics and you, you know, the weight you give can be based on right when they were published. And like you're talking, John, with the what happened in 2017, where, you know, it was just everything all at once. <laughs> um, this is where that would get really fuzzy and I'm not sure how yet that, you know, what, which came first, the chicken or the egg and which becomes the you know, more highly adopted method, uh, you know, before you can actually get to, you know, the evolutionary relationship. That's, but again, when you, when you've got a, a whole bunch of stuff and this is going to be really popular, especially in NLP that puts out, you know, 25,000 papers a year, <laughs> um, you know, being able to tell which comes first is going to always remain nebulous unless we want to start putting in hours, minutes, and seconds, I suppose. But you could theoretically get a first occurrence out of an analysis of your bibliometric data, correct? Brenda? Um, you could get close. The, the issue being that, um, again, it's going to be limited by the dates, really, that it's, that it's even entered, right, with its publication date. And uh, so, you know, 
depending on, I, I suppose, if you went by journal, you know, if you limited the journal, you, but again, that's not really getting at the one topic that you might be after. Because it would be spread, spread across several journals. So publication dates made me think of something else. They made me think of preprint servers like Archive and MetArchive. And the, there's two interesting aspects of that. One is some of these, uh, some of these seminal papers are appear or have appeared on preprint um, uh, quite a while, quite a few months ahead of their final publication date. I think there was an example, Jim Handler did a, um, a commentary on a paper that had appeared, I think in the D December science. Um, and that, that paper first appeared not his commentary, but the, the, the preprint of that paper uh, appeared in like January or February of last year. So it was out there influencing. Um, but the, the flip side of those preprints is some of those preprint papers are garbage. Right. right? MedArchive is vetted, but, uh, but Archive, you just put it there. So is it possible to use bibliometrics to BS check to some extent? <laughs> well, you see what I'm saying? You know, if you, you... I would tell you that I think Ahmed's on the call. <laughs> and, <laughs> I know he is, and he's been he's and, been trying yeah, in the chat yeah. also. Yeah, I was going to say, and he has um, quite a bit of you know know how his thesis work was in uh, truth detection, right? Fact checking, so. He could probably speak to that better than I can. Um, but yes, I agree. There's, I don't know yet exactly how, you know, uh, how we live in a post-truth world. <laughs> so Brenda, <laughs> you've, um, you've kind of, uh, I guess, slanted this talk towards like, um, what, what papers do you need for a literature review? Um, but I'm also wondering, um, could this be applied to, like, say you read a, you're learning a new domain, right? And you read a paper and the first time you read it, like it doesn't make any sense whatsoever, but it's like an important paper that you need to understand. Could you use something like this to then um, go and be like, okay, well, what papers do I have to now read to be able to understand the topic that's in this seminal paper? Actually, I mean, that I think that would be a really good use of, of this sort of, uh, toolkit, if you will, um, to again, limit, you know, I've just recently had to learn a whole bunch of stuff about prebiotic chemistry and, um, that has not gone well, um, because picking up the language is incredibly difficult. I am not a chemist at any stretch. And so, yes. So having something like this, that yeah, points you directly to, if you can, pull the keywords or, you know, um, authors from the seminal work that you start with, um, yes, you should be able to limit what or direct yourself towards the next best paper to go to. So, so, so I'm just wondering, um, so, so that something like this means this doesn't obviously exist yet. And um, so, so what is your goal to actually create this or a piece of it? Or um, so, um, have you actually done any of the NLP parts, or um, like how far have you gone in the workflow? Are you trying to get through the whole workflow where the end result would be this literature recommendation system, or are you planning on doing kind of like just part of the semantic analysis piece of it? What, what's your goal well, for this? That's a great question. So. Ultimately, right, so I have used a test case. It was a high energy physics theory uh, data set and have basically ran through this whole process. And ultimately what I'm leaning towards is being able to um, look at the evolution of a, of a scientific field. So, um, so, yeah, basically that's it. I wanna wind up with some way that you could, easily go and say, okay, so how did 
um, how did these theories evolve? Um, you know, so we should be able to trace back where that theory started um, in literature and then ultimately see how it uh, essentially densified if you will, right? As it became more popular, it would it would you know you would see an upward trend, um, and whether or not that falls off, or uh, you know exactly how that evolves and what the effect is, who's tied to that is really my interest. And that's your deliverable to create something that can do that. Yes. And describe a, it's it's basic basically what I'm tasked with doing is creating a descriptive analysis of, uh, of of a research domain, essentially a scientific domain. Interesting, good luck. Yeah, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> Gonna need it. I have a question. Yes. Uh, so first of all, great talk, thank you. I, I can't wait to try out some of the tools you mentioned myself. Um, I'm curious though, cause I'm, I'm kind of new to this area. So in bibliometrics, when you're looking at a citation for the paper, are all citations created equal? I know you talked a little bit about uh, how many times they're cited, they're used themselves, but do you look at, because I, I feel like there's a difference between the citations you put in a paper. Like there's some citations where you're pulling on some definitions from earlier work, others where you're looking at related work that you're trying to compare yourself to. and maybe other papers that are a little bit more core to like the main thread of the evolving research. Are those sort of features uh, explored in bibliometrics? And that's, you know, so kind of at the core of bibliometrics is the whole citation analysis. And um, there is a ton of literature on just how biased this, uh, you know, that whole genre itself is. And so there's a lot of problems with citation analysis, just and the way we cite papers um, is a, is problematic. Um, so so there's no so it, so it's a faulty system to begin with is what I'm trying to say, and there's no real further metadata necessarily tied to it. So figuring out why someone uh, cited a particular paper may not be clear, and I'm not sure how I would get at whether or not. Okay. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> Any other questions? I love the idea that not all citations are created equal. <laughs> yes. <laughs> So, uh, so early on, I think you mentioned Bradford's law, or yes. someone's law, right? Um, I, yeah. I didn't really understand it. So, so you have a paper, and you read that paper, and that paper has a bunch of citations. And is Bradford's law, or I guess in your example, you read like five papers, and each of those five papers have a bunch of citations. And so is Bradford's law is don't even bother reading the citations from those papers because you're not it's not it's not worth going down that rabbit hole. So yeah, so the so it's the it's basically a law of diminishing returns, if you will, right? So basically, um, what it what it is is it's much more focused on the at the journal level. So it says you know basically if you know you know in um, I couldn't even give you five top journals in data science, but, you know, say you had five top journals and, you know, and out of those five journals, you get in, in a month, there's actually 12, you know, say there's 10 articles that are actually worth your time to read. Um, in order to find 10 more, you have to search 10 more journals. It's a doubling situation, right? So you would have to search 10 more journals to find five more articles or 10 more articles. And then the, again, then to find 10 more, then you've got to do another 20. Um, and, and it keeps increasing exponentially. So there's, it's like I said, it's just basically a law of diminishing returns. So it's, so the, the issue with the journals is that, so when you go to bibliometrics, they're only going to 
source those top five journals because they know that researchers won't go beyond those top five because it doesn't make sense time-wise for you to continue searching. So it's kind of an area area under the long tail curve is what yes. you're sort of saying. You have to just yes. keep going out there. Um, the, 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 the middle law, so, so that was, so that it's Bradford's law, right? Bradford's, Bradford's law. law. Yeah, there's and, Bradford's and then, law. And then was Lotke's law was the... Uh, Lotkes. And these are both derivations, if you will, of Zip's law, Z-I-P-F. Um, mm -hmm. right? And um, so Lotkes is, is right, it, it, it's a frequency, right? Frequency of publication. And so with authors, so basically the it, what it describes is as, you know, as the there's an increase in the number of articles being published, the authors publishing those articles actually decreases. So you have an increase, that's a terrible way to describe that. Um, so basically there, it's, a, it's a given ratio, right, of the number of uh, authors publishing to a, sing, a single article, right? So, hmm. The ratio doesn't change. A single article or a single topic? Yeah, I think you meant topic. Topic, yes. Single topic. Mm -hmm. Which kind of makes sense, right? Because like when when a author first publishes on a new topic, they're going to be the only author publishing on that topic. And then um, so their ratio of publishing on that topic increases. But then as that or, or is high to begin with, um, but then as the topic becomes more well known more people are publishing on that topic so then um, the author's percentage of articles on that topic uh, starts to decrease as more people start writing about that topic unless their name is Robert Hazen in which case they're on every article <laughs> <laughs> but, John and I okay what's that I say John and I have typed Robert Hazen a few too many times into D space. <laughs> well, well, and Ahmed Alish and Anarud. <laughs> yep. <laughs> and S. M. Morrison. <laughs> um, but okay, so but that kind of so Laka's law it kind of characterizes the whole hog piling on a topic sort of. Yes. Thing, right? Yeah. So, it, so it's again, so again, skewing the data, per se, if you will. You have to be aware of it so that you can control for it, right? Well, yeah, but Bradford's is a little less intuitive. Well, it in a way it is, in a way it it, it isn't. I mean, I think that so you had asked a question earlier on, it, on kind of how to use these tools. And that sort of thing. And what I was reflecting on, you know, the, the olden days, you would try to find, um, as you commence a, a, a literature review on a new domain, you tried to find those golden papers, a few papers that were very citation rich, uh, whether they were review papers or just seminal papers, but they were citation rich. And then you kind of Took, you use those as almost like a textbook uh, and, 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 a, and a reading guide to exploring that, cracking open that field. And, and that would create kind of a, a, a network. You would construct this network of other, of other literature following, following those, the, the net that was introduced by those few handful of seminal papers. Um, now we have these tools to, to help you do that rather than microfish and other cranky card catalogs <laughs> librarians <clears throat> librarian well that that requires talking to a person but yeah, yeah. You're... <laughs> and we happen to have a new wonderful librarian if you haven't met him he's worth it <laughs> so so you asked a, a really good question when you when you finished your the the, the first part friend is what metadata um really 
I, I guess what, what would be on your wish list for the, you know, what metadata do you look forward to creating that helps really um, in, enable this work to be done in a new field? Well, I mean, so there's generally, um, somehow I would like to see in the metadata itself, um, more information about the paper. So generally, right, they, they allow for authors to supply keywords um, really when the paper is submitted. What's that? I reckon I might have been a hound in the past time. So I smell the same peasant stench I got a whip of when we first met. Ah, okay. Sorry, I had something in my ear. It's been frustrating. That's really weird. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> mm. um, so, yeah, I, hmm. I don't, I can't, there's too many possibilities. Okay. So if I had to limit it to, you know, two um, top metadata fields, I would love to see the uh, paper information. And that for me would be, you know, Yeah, my brain's going from really big to really small. <laughs> so, well, well, here's a way to, a different way you could answer that. You know, Brenda, in some of the conversations you and I have had, you've talked about the need to sort of progressively NLP into the paper to get more yeah. depth. Talk, maybe talk a little bit the difference between, uh, you know, title, you know, getting in metadata from the extracting data from the title versus the abstract, whether or not to actually consider keywords, okay. introduction, you know, why don't you maybe talk through um, progressively how you can get more value? Well, so, you know, papers have, right, we all know this from reading them, right, papers have standard sections. Right, so we have the introduction, the methods section, um, the results, the discussion, um, and you know, ultimately the references. Right now, you know, we keep good track of the the references. If we could actually have access to you know individual sections of the paper, um, you know, in the introduction, generally we cover all of those, you know, those historical things, if you will, and, and areas that you know, that we're bringing together to, to do our research. So there's going to be a lot of citations potential in, in that particular area of your paper generally. Um, and so with that, you know, then if you can actually, you know, if I'm doing a literature review, I just might need just the methods. And if I could get it just the methods, boy, that would help me just streamline, you know, exactly what I, what are the popular methods? What, who is doing you know, I could actually say who's doing which particular method, what maybe I could even pull out, you know, what are the particular um, equipment that they're using, right, uh, to do these, to apply these particular methods. Um, you know, so there's all of, you know, just breaking down the paper itself seems to have a whole bunch of potential for, you know, mining, you know, that kind of, of you know, just comparing an intro to an intro, to, or, you know, more likely comparing a method section to a method section um, would really be just eye opening for what you could find. Um, I would think the different kinds of papers, I mean, uh, an AI paper and a um, bioinformatics paper, the paper and, <laughs> you know, on you know, from the Tau Consortium on, on Alzheimer's and stuff, there's those two different worlds, but, uh, <laughs> but yet the, the, the latter is very highly constructed. They're very dictated in what the structure of that, of their, what they write is. So. Right. Yeah. I mean, one of the, one of the problems of, of NLP, you know, just even as an entire field is the, that, that, you know, there's not a one-to-one -one correspondence with, you know, word to meaning. So, you know, until we have a one-to-one -one correspondence, how accurate, you know, NLP can get is always going to be somewhat nebulous. We're not really going to be able to be 
real accurate. And I was going to say, you just um, scanning for and comparing methods or scanning and comparing uh, literature searches and papers is not going to be useful because you pull out, you, you destroy the context in which all of that stuff was written. Right. So at that point, you're really just looking at a word search. And you still need to apply a lot of human brain power to it. So if you were going to do something like comparing methods from across different papers, you would, that's a, that's a whole different dissertation project and you would <laughs> definitely yeah. need to combine a couple of doing. NLP methods there. Well, I, and I would say too, also to that is that, you know, but if what I'm doing could actually lead to this space, right? And that if you can actually drill down to finding, you know, the papers that are very relevant, then being able to just pull just those methods and find the common methods that are there can be, can help provide, you know, fodder for you to, you know, discuss which method you would use and why. So this works within a discipline. What if you're trying to do something cross-disciplinary? This is where, you know, you see semantic shifts here, but uh, on the slide, but one of the things that's, that's really becoming, you know, an issue, as we know, is, you know, science itself is becoming more and more interdisciplinary, cross-disciplinary, uh, multidisciplinary, if you will. And with that, you know, what's happening is, um, you know, one particular domain defines a particular process or a particular, uh, you know, item in it with a set of words that, you know, the, the neighboring domain may not use any of those words at all to describe it. Um, and so, you know, it, it, not to mention, you know, that you, you have those situations where when a tool was originally invented, um, it was called, you know, wasn't called, you know, a, a mass spectrometer when it very first came out. <laughs> you know, it's that sort of thing. So, you know, tracing that back along with these other, um, elements of that uh, and connecting those across disciplines is, is a definitely an end hard problem. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah, not, not clear on that, yeah. on how to get at that yet. Although Dr. Groupie, who recently graduated, did some great work on semantic shift. And so hopefully there'll be more work in that area coming soon. All right, do we have any other questions out there? With that, let's. Thank you guys. I think we're, we're supposed to use our little hand wavy things for a WebEx. We have a lot of go. practice. <laughs> Here we go. There we go. <laughs> All right, and I'm gonna stop the recording.